Yo, what's up everybody? I um, I'm in my car as you can see making a video uh, and here's the topic of today drunk in the Holy Spirit I want to talk about this topic because so many people that I know people that I don't really know that well they might send me a message or email if I preach somewhere they ask me questions about this all the time that is the issue of being drunk in the spirit and uh, in the church today we have so much division so many people uh, call themselves against the charismatic experience and so many people obviously in favor of it and it seems like there's a discrepancy. I mean, how people translate the Bible, how people understand what the scriptures teach on this issue. Uh, but the bottom line is this. It boils down to a few basic thoughts in the heart of God that I want to uh, introduce to you today. And maybe if you've heard this before, maybe it will just affirm what you, uh, what you resonate with in your spirit. The first thing is this. Why would God release his spirit to us and... Uh, in the place of drunkenness why would he do that I think the first thing is you gotta look at this generation there's such an assault on the character of God so many fingers pointing at God saying that God is not good saying that God's forsaken us if God's so good why do evil things happen or God's not really who he says he is God's not trustworthy God's not dependable over and over again you hear these assaults on the character of God and even as believers uh, the enemy creeps in and I believe this is true he deceives us with these assaults on the character of God he is the accuser of the brethren he makes the accusation against the character of God all the time from the beginning of, of the fall of man when he deceived Eve in the garden he made her uh, believe something to be true about God that wasn't true and and that's been kind of his way of working against people in and out of the church all through history is he assaults the character of God what I've experienced is that when I've been overwhelmed with the Spirit of God and I experience what we call the drunkenness in the Holy Spirit it, it, it for one it's like taking you and putting you on the operating table when you go into surgery they don't just cut you open and start pulling out body parts they give you an anesthesia so that you don't feel that pain because your pain tolerance is not that high you would literally uh, scream and holler and you wouldn't be able to have the surgery that you need so a lot of times the drunkenness in the spirit or that falling out when people lay hands and you might see them fall over it's actually the Holy Spirit putting them on the operating table so that he can go into their heart and expose and do a deep work of deliverance now the evidence that they've truly encountered God is that when they get up off the ground or when the hoopla or the emotion of it is over with have they been transformed by that encounter with God and if the answer is no or if there's a continual cycle of, of sin in that person's life then I would highly doubt that they actually encountered the living God it's very possible that they encountered an unclean spirit or familiar spirit uh, so this issue again with the character of God now in my personal life I used to get drunk in the world so I know what being drunk with with alcohol is all about I remember the stupid choices I made over and over again uh, when I lost cognizance of my um, you know surroundings and my choices were influenced by alcohol the Bible says do not be drunk with wine so it condemns that it says that wine is a mocker it, it, it over and over again is is against drunkenness in the scripture but to be filled with the Holy Spirit that parallel that we see there do not be drunk with wine but be filled with the Spirit is basically saying that you in the same way that people are controlled by alcohol you be controlled by the Holy Spirit with alcohol natural alcohol there's no control you lose self-control the Holy Spirit one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control so when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you receive, receive that uh, baptism you receive that that fruit of self-control Well, you should at least be growing in that so it's not a drunkenness that it causes you to lose restraint it causes you to yield to surrender to have self-control but it also it does alleviate the fear you know this is kind of going to sound kind of bad but you know how people when they meet a girl if they're drunk they make a joke and say oh I got the beer goggles on I forgot what she looked like without the beer goggles the next day they don't realize uh, that that girl they thought was like some super hot girl is really not that's called the beer goggles but in the Holy Spirit when you're drunk with the Holy Spirit you actually see things for what they actually are so the deceptions in the world around us many times we look at around and we think things are one way but we come to find out through the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit that it's not so case in point would be the issues of homosexuality the issues of abortion the issues of poverty 
through a humanistic goggle or worldview or a lens through which we interpret the world around us, we interpret it humanistically. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're possessed by the Spirit of God and not the Spirit of this age, you begin to see through it all for truth. Truthfully speaking, what is happening all around us? What is happening in politics? What is happening societally uh, in this world? So it's an essential. Now, the other thing I want to touch on really quick um, is the need for drunkenness in the Spirit. And this hour is critical. In the book of Acts, uh, you see that the Holy Spirit came with power and cloven tongues of fire rested on all of their heads. And it says that they began to declare the wonderful praises of God out in the open, in the streets. They were in the upper room. And then moments later, they were out in the streets worshiping God. Now, the people all around marveled at them, and they heard them speaking in their own languages, and they said, they must be drunk on new wine. That's literally what it says in Acts chapter 2. Peter stands up empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he begins to proclaim the gospel about how this Jesus whom you've crucified, God have made him both Lord and Christ. And he begins to give witness to the resurrection, and many people are converted that day. In fact, 3,000 are added that day. Now, I don't know about you, but many people are so timid and afraid to share the gospel. They won't share the gospel. you got to, like tell them all kind of stuff you're going to get a crown in heaven you're going to you got to basically uh bribe people to evangelize more often than not in the american church but what god is doing in this generation is what peter alluded to in the latter days i'll pour out my spirit on all flesh this is what that really is it's a people sons and daughters that prophesy old men that dream dreams maid servants and men servants all the the whole nine yards across the world receiving a inundation, a empowering, a feeling of the Holy Spirit that not just gives them a good emotional experience in church one day, but it propels them to preach the everlasting gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, to preach the death and the resurrection, the ascension, and the second coming of the day of His justice. That's what being drunk or filled with the Spirit in a ministerial sense should lead us to. So, being drunk in the spirit, first of all, is to do surgery on your heart, to cleanse out the deceptions, the unclean spirits, to bring deliverance to captives. The second thing the Holy Spirit does, it, it gives us power to be a witness. Jesus told them, you will receive power to be my witness. Tarry in Jerusalem until you get power from on high. The third thing it does is it not only gives us power to preach the gospel with, with, uh, with signs and wonders accompanying, but it brings unity to the church. If you look in the book of Acts, they had all things in common. No man considered his own possession to be his but they had all things in common they were unified they went about bringing the gospel all over the world the church astronomically grew daily there was no sick or poor among them people with demons were healed and delivered what we pray and believe the church to be in this hour happened in that hour for one reason the presence of the Holy Spirit they didn't have a Bible there was no arguments over which translation is best what they did have was the comforter. What they did have was the power from heaven that enabled them to give witness to the resurrection with many signs and wonders. The gospel message was fully preached and the church was unified. That's what God is after. That's what being filled with the Holy Spirit is unto. It's to give us basically the same power that Jesus had, but it has to be received freely by the church you can't have the spirit of religion and say oh that's just for the char charismatic the crazy people god wants to pour out his spirit on his church you can call yourself pentecostal and not have the holy spirit you can call yourself uh, uh orthodox baptist staunch arminian or calvinist whatever and not have the holy spirit the bottom line is do you have a witness of jesus christ have you experienced the resurrection power not only in the story of the gospel but in your own life have you been raised with christ because the bible says that if we've been raised with christ we ought to thank on those things that are in heaven and without the holy spirit of god to make sense of this world around us without eyes that see in the spirit the reality of what's going on around us we can't think on things that are in heaven so i want to challenge you today in, in uh, luke 11 it says if you being evil, Jesus said this, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? So many of you struggle with sin, you're in bondage to pornography, homosexuality, you're secular, you're worldly, you love everything in the world, you hate God. But here's the deal, unless you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you will continue in your sin, you will continue in that state of, of lukewarm Christianity, and God wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire so that you burn for Him, 
in this generation so that you're a light that shines in a dark world. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is unto. And if it doesn't lead you to be a witness, then you have not received the real deal.